Well, hello, Sheila. Hello, Thomas. <laughs> We've just been fighting with the software. <laughs> Made a good fight. We softened off and now we're here. Okay. Delighted to be able to talk to you today and just ask a few questions about a really important area, your area in particular. I know it's an area you've quite a tickle for. Would that be fair to say? Yes. I've got a few questions here and other questions might pop up. The first question is inclusive leadership, Sheila. What is it and why bother? I love that. Why bother? So the first thing is, I think, inclusive leadership, whenever I ask anyone in my PhD research or in industry, thousands of answers. And the reason for that is when we hear inclusion, we project onto it everything that we think it should be, and as well as when we hear the word leader. So I define it as inclusive leadership is the utilising of inclusion practices to lead effectively. But it can be leadership in any form of leadership. And what I mean by that is you could be a leader with the title of leader. So you're the CEO or you're on the exec team or something like that. It could also be that you influence others in thought leadership in some way or expertise. So people come to you and listen to you and trust what you say. And then the other form of leadership that is often overlooked is social leadership. So this is where your relationships with people, people allow you to influence them because they trust you because of the relationships you have with them. And a lot of the time we only think about leadership in that formal role. But in my work, I think that inclusive leadership has to be happening in all three of those forms of leadership, I guess, the kind of thought leadership, the social leadership, and then the kind of formal leadership. And it's just utilising inclusion practices to be effective, to get the job done, to have the impact you're meant to have. To me, inclusive leadership isn't the end goal. So for a lot of diversity, equity and inclusion activities, inclusive leadership might be positioned as the end goal. Whereas, and I guess based on my background in leadership, My position is that inclusive leadership is a way to lead, to achieve business and organizational objectives so that people can thrive and the organization can perform. So that's how I'd frame it. And there's kind of a few of those little specific details that matter, I guess, in it. Okay. What's the difference between inclusive leadership being seen as an end goal and inclusive leadership being seen as a way to lead? Yes. So inclusive leadership, if the end goal is inclusive leadership, And that's it. What often ends up happening is leaders can become distracted by trying to meet the needs of inclusion. So trying to be inclusive rather than trying to use inclusion to meet their goals as a leader, basically is how I frame the difference. There's nothing wrong with the idea that inclusive leadership is the end goal. If you're doing inclusive leadership development, then you might want to be more of an inclusive leader. So you might be aiming for something. But the reality is that inclusive leadership is a social process. So it's an ongoing activity. I can't really say I'm an inclusive leader because I might have been inclusive in this moment, in this decision making, but in the next one, I might not be. So to me, inclusive leadership is an activity. It's a practice rather than something I got a certificate for or something that someone else calls me. So for instance, sometimes people will say, yeah, well, my team say I'm an inclusive leader. And I'll be like, okay, so for your team, you're considered an inclusive leader, but would others consider you an inclusive leader? And then that's where we start to realize that the practice might be something that's more natural or easier in some settings to you than in others. And so using inclusive leadership as a way of doing all your work, all your leading, as opposed to just trying to be an inclusive leader, I think can help you stay on track. So leadership exists for a reason in organizations, that's to achieve organizational outcomes. And it can help you to use inclusive leadership as a way to do your job well, rather than be a lot of extra work that might not always feel like it's connected to the purpose of your leadership or your work. So that to me is kind of the difference. It's that it's aligned with your work and helping you achieve it rather than it's an additional extra separate thing that you do. So in reading your book, the very thing you're speaking about there is where I felt a a lot of relief just fall off my shoulders because all of that extra stuff maybe I didn't realize I had in my head and my ideas about it fell down and I realized this is a way of just made it a lot lighter. Like what's the, if someone is listening now and they haven't read your book and they're curious to know about inclusive leadership, but it just feels like there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And if I do it wrong, it's very wrong. I'm trying to point to between inclusive leadership that's aligned and inclusive leadership, this extra effort. And if it's wrong, Mm -hmm. I'm wrong. Yeah. So the first thing is that inclusive leadership will require most of us adapt how we do things. So just to say that, because it's a practice, it's something that we will have to adapt in some way. But the difference is we adapt to achieve the outcome that we're aiming for rather than 
just doing extra things to seem inclusive, I suppose, is, is the purpose. I think your point about that relief comes from the difference between placing inclusive leadership as like a moral should and that you should either be it or not to a practice that everybody is can choose to engage with wherever they are in their career or in their organization but that it's very practical and it's not about being worthy or unworthy or good enough or not good enough it's actually about making the choice to use these practices so that how you lead can be more inclusive and also the title of the book inclusive leadership navigating organizational complexity the reason that navigating organizational complexity is there is because inclusive leadership is not a one size fits all and when we try to teach it that way or apply it that way people end up overwhelmed with a list of extra things to do that might not feel connected to their own day-to-day -day realities or work but also what ends up happening is people forget that in our organizations there are nuances and influences and considerations that we must all take into account to make the decision about what's the next best step forward and that's true for inclusion as well so the navigating organizational complexity means that there's sets of practices and principles we discuss in the book but you have to look around you and say, where is the next place that I apply these concepts, these practices? What is most fitting for this my reality right now? So I give the example sometimes in organizations, something that is popular in one organization is applied to another because people don't know what to do and they're panicking or they have anxiety. So they just kind of go, oh, that activity is the right thing. But they might completely miss the fact that the needs of the people you're trying to meet might not be the most important needs. And it might just be topical in another organization or because something is happening in society that people are discussing it. But actually your organization might need something very specific so that people can perform better, people can thrive at work, they can get their work done, they can do great work, but that they are also thriving in the organization. And I suppose one of the things that I've noticed is that often inclusive leadership is talked about like it's a moral high ground it can be talked about in a very critical way very should you know we should do this we should do that rather than engaging leaders and employees and people in organizations to critically think about how could I use this to help me in my reality you know how do I use inclusive leadership to solve this problem differently what I try to do in the book because we're all human and we're all like doing our best most of the time in my experience that I try to help people think about how to use inclusive leadership practically rather than having a list of ways that they're not inclusive or a list of ways that they are somehow deficit. So the book is very much written from a strengths-based perspective, utilizing that kind of coaching psychology. So I think that the relief you're pointing to is that piece. We're thinking about inclusive leadership as a practice. We're thinking about it as choices. We're thinking about it as strengths, like Lots of the time when I work with people, they are like, I, I'm not very inclusive. And then I point at multiple practices that were inclusive that they just never considered as inclusive. And then also we point at, oh, this is an opportunity to be more inclusive and achieve the outcomes you're trying to create. So I think a lot of that relief piece comes back to some of those kind of underlying principles that I work with in the book. So being strengths focused, not shaming ourselves or others, not furthering what I call splitting. It's a psychological term. It's where we kind of have to other we decide something is good and something is bad rather than something is and then how do we work with that as it is so I think that's kind of what you were pointing to some of that kind of those foundational principles are not just what I'm talking about in inclusive leadership but trying to weave into the book so that as you're reading it you're feeling oh you know I'm not a bad person because I don't know these things or I'm not a bad person because I don't know how to do these things or I don't even know where to start I'm just a person and I'm starting now what can I do better for the next step? Like, where are my opportunities for inclusion rather than a corrective approach, which is what's wrong? What isn't good enough? What do I need to do more of? So, so I think that kind of ethos is weaved throughout the book, not just in what I've said, but in the approach that I'm trying to take in the book. Mm, okay. I can feel it just you're saying it. So if there was leaders, managers, or people who are interested in inclusive leadership, or they've heard the word inclusive leadership, but they get confused about what it actually is. You know, sometimes there could be a lot of talk about something, but it can be confusing mm. to know what it is, especially like I imagine in your world, you're in it every day. It's your passion, like you, you live it, you breathe it. 
am you working it if someone is curious and interested you know for example if there's someone watching now and they're like okay this sounds interesting what does this mean in my reality one or two examples of inclusive leadership to someone who's just kind of starting to step their toes in and be like okay this this could be helpful and i'm actually from listening to sheila so far i'm after realizing oh this doesn't have to be really hard i can actually bring myself to this so I suppose inclusive leadership is complex and I don't want to pretend it's not, but that doesn't mean you can't move forward. You know, there is this saying, somebody I worked with, Deirdre, she used to say, how do you eat an elephant one spoon at a time for not to eat any elephants? But I think it's a good example of inclusive leadership does mean loads of things and there's multiple layers. What we can do is start to alter small defaults that we have so that we can use inclusion to get better results. So for instance, a lot of the time when I'm working with people and they're making decisions about something, I might say to them, oh, did you ask somebody that? Like, did you ask anybody? Oh, no. Well, if you did, that would probably be the starting point for a more inclusive experience because somebody would give you information that you could make a decision on rather than you thinking you always have to ask, have the answers. The other thing is it's a bit of a concept, but rather than thinking individuals perform individually, so thinking that your performance is solely down to you or that anyone in your team or anyone you work with, thinking about performance in organizations from a collective perspective. So what is happening in this team or in this group that is supporting people to perform? What is happening that might be limiting people's performance? And so for me, it's not necessarily about kind of like putting the word inclusion on it or even uh, talking about diversity. It's really about saying, OK, how do I, you know, include more so that we can get more robust, more rich results? And one of the things that I say to everyone is inclusion is everyone's business for one main reason. We all need to be included to perform at our best. For us to thrive, we have we don't want to be wasting energy on not feeling like we belong or hiding our uniqueness. So inclusion is everyone's business in an organization because it's directly related to how people feel at work and behave at work. And so you don't need a leadership title to bring inclusion to life. You can just start to include people to consider things you haven't thought about before do things with others and not just looking at it individually. So first of all is you can ask people questions rather than assuming answers or making decisions. The second thing you can do is you can think about performance in a team kind of environment perspective. So you might say, oh, our team is underperforming or, oh, I'm really struggling to perform or, you know, we're not meeting these deadlines. Rather than just internalizing it about individuals, you could ask, what is happening in this environment that we could improve to help others perform. It doesn't mean that individuals aren't also responsible, but it means that we're thinking about the environment together so that we can think about what might be a way of supporting performance. And then the other thing I would say is, if we were being inclusive, what we're doing is we're managing our power. And I talk about it in the book. There's a whole lot on it in the book. But what I mean by managing our power is we're not just always feeling responsible for delivering it's always up to me individually, or I must always have the answers, or I must always be the smartest in the room. What we're thinking about is, how do I share power? How do I leverage the wisdom in this room of more than just myself, or just an individual? And so if we're thinking about power in terms of sharing it, learning from each other, collaborating more, we're going to find that inclusion comes with that, because they are the behaviours that result in, in the experience of inclusion and people being included. So you don't need a title and you don't need to call it diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. You don't need to even use the word inclusion. You just need to know that when we include people, we get better results. People thrive, like the benefits. And you said in the beginning, you know, why bother? Well, because people thrive, organisations thrive. It makes sense to be inclusive. But we can't do it alone. So I can't just decide what is inclusive. We actually have to do it with people and say, how do we make this space more inclusive? How do we get better results in these meetings? How do we deal with feedback in a way that's better? How do we attract better talent? How do we retain our talent? Like inclusion and inclusive leadership is all about helping individuals and organizations to thrive. It isn't about ticking boxes. So you don't have to use the word inclusion or inclusive to be inclusive. You just need to be thinking about how you can be more inclusive. Do you feel that there's people who might have listened to what you just said and feel like a huge amount of relief? Like, oh, great, I don't have to have the words on the wall. I can actually just do it in my day-to-day -day behavior. 
I hope so. I suppose my aim is that inclusion is not even a decision. It is a practice and it is built on some principles. And there's 13 of them in the book. My aim is that you could read the book and you could go, oh, that might be a more inclusive way to do it. And like, even though I wrote the book, I'm not telling you what is inclusive because what is inclusive will differ in different environments. The point is that everybody could pick it up and go, oh, that's an opportunity for me to improve my performance in some way or improve my work in some way and include people. So I'm hoping that people feel relief, but also inspired or motivated to focus on something to make a change. So I would just say it's not about big grand gestures. It's not about telling people you're an inclusive leader. It is actually about you using inclusion to help the people around you thrive and to achieve your responsibilities in your role at work. And nobody is an expert in it, right? You can know about the topic all day long. The practice of inclusion is an ongoing thing. The amount of events or engagements that I've engaged with that talked about inclusion while not practicing it is vast, which is one of the reasons that kind of prompted me to do the book but also I myself am in a room and somebody says oh this would have been a more inclusive thing to do and I'm like oh yeah great thing let me make a note of that I've learned something today I can use that this is not about perfecting it is not about doing everything right now it is about making better choices today that can become your default so that tomorrow you can make better choices because your defaults have improved it is about and I guess maybe it's my coaching background or kind of org development practices change happens over process and over time and over practice and my focus is on helping actual change while acknowledging that that organizations of different contexts and you can't just decide something is or isn't inclusive the context has an impact on it the system has an impact and so yeah I hope people feel relief but I also hope that the relief gives them room now to practice something rather than to lay back you know yeah would you say that your book is an invitation to evolve I guess from reading your book myself, I really felt like, oh, where I am is good and there's information here that can help me improve versus, you know, sometimes you can read books and I don't know what it is. Sometimes you feel like, oh, this is the expert and I need to do all those things. What is it about your book that you feel would be helpful? Yes. So I think we had this conversation when you read like one of the very early drafts. It is an invitation, but but it's also, and, and I say this in the beginning, I'm giving you things to think about. I'm not telling you what to think. I Mm. share what I think, but it's really important that people have a relationship with it rather than take what I say, digest it and accept it. There's a piece here about critical thinking and it's an invitation to think about these things to then kind of decide how you yourself want to move forward. The other thing is I think because I use a trauma-informed approach in all my work, I'm always thinking about how the experiences of trauma are in our workplaces and in our individual lives in lots of different ways, whether we identify with it or not. Trauma-informed approaches are good for everyone, even if people haven't experienced trauma. And so I try to write the book with that trauma-informed lens there. So not using shame to instigate kind of action, not creating like emotional reactions that are triggering shame, not good enough, that provoke a sense of urgency, but not from a desire to change something, but from a desire to get away from a feeling. So I try to use a trauma-informed approach in the book, as well as like the choices in the book. So choice is a big part of of being trauma-informed. So I try to have choices in the book, reflections, the ability for people to move through the book and have a different experience to others, rather than setting something up as right, and therefore everything else is wrong. There are things within the book, and I have two fabulous contributors, Dr. Liz Wilson, who has two fabulous papers, the 2023 and the 2024, which is the eight inclusion needs of all people. She's contributed to the book. It's fabulous. And then also I have Lynn Killick from Leading Kind in Scotland. And Lynn's contribution is really interesting as well. And all of us, we've written from this perspective of so that you have understanding, then you can make choices. Here are some things that don't work very well. Here are some things that work better. But it doesn't decide that someone is right and someone is wrong or that there's only one way to view this because there isn't. That's why even the academic research, there's not an agreed definition on it. In industry, all the work I've been doing, there isn't an agreed definition. Some people think inclusive leadership is just for people who are marginalised and inclusive leadership does need to meet the needs of people that are marginalised. But in organisations, if your inclusive leadership isn't about everyone, it's not inclusive. So I think we don't use kind of othering or polarisation or kind of assumptions that just because some people might have 
privilege in some areas that they don't in some other way need, have needs and supports in the workplace that need to be considered included so that they can perform. And so I, I think we're trying to write it from that kind of trauma-informed, strengths-based perspective, positive regard. I think it's really helpful to assume everyone's doing their best. And in the book, I assume anyone who's bought the book is to do their best. And so I try to write with that kind of approach. And look, sometimes I succeed and sometimes I fail at it. But I do think that a trauma-informed lens, even how it's written, is really important because there's lots of marketing out there. There's lots of different uh, teaching approaches that people utilise which is based on kind of triggering feelings of shame or people not being good enough or fear of missing out in some way. Whereas what I've tried to do is write about kind of what we can aspire to, the realities that we're facing in our day to days in organisations, the challenges that inclusion brings up because it brings in some complexities. And also I'm writing it with this idea that we're together in it, as opposed mm. to I'm all knowing and you must do what I tell you. If I was you know, I'm sure I'd be far more successful than I currently am. But also I think that, so while I write the book and I have lots of insights and I do have expertise in the area, expertise versus expert are two different things. I also think I know that readers are going to have a relationship with the book, contact me and say, Sheila, you know, you didn't really clarify this or I don't think you considered this position. And therefore we are in the book together, like we are in contact. And while I have to commit to something to publish the book, I'm sure in 10 years, I will have to look back on this book. I'll have learned loads and need to edit it and change it. And so for me, it's a we thing. I think the book is, to the best of my ability, written so that we are going on this journey together. I might be giving you some tools, skills, strategies, concepts, ideas, previous successes, evidence from research to help guide you in your decision making. But where you end up will be different to other readers and to you know where others end up because I leave room for the complexity of your organisation, the reality of who you are as an individual, your values, your challenges. I leave room for that reality. So rather than me pointing at what good looks like and, and that there's only one outcome, my goal would be, and like I put that big goal out there in the world to support one million people with inclusive leadership. Well, that's only going to be possible if people read the book, bring it to life, and then they have a ripple effect. You know what I mean? They go out into the world and, and they're having an impact on other people. So People will bring this to life in different ways. And I wanted to leave room for that to happen. I just don't think that that's effective. Like, how could I write about inclusive leadership in a way that doesn't actually utilize the practice of inclusion or even leadership? You know, if I was to write about it as if I'm the only one setting the direction, like I am writing on the back of amazing people. Like there's so many references in there, but also so many people have inspired the work. I didn't just start one day. You know what I mean? There were these influences long before I even knew I was being influenced and those things have shaped where I've got to, but other people are going to pick it up and shape it in their own way. And because I want to include other people's shaping of it, I don't want to be the one limiting it to one definition of it. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Very thorough answer. Time-wise, I know we said we want to go on because as, as we, we would probably talk for the whole day if we could. If there are people who would be like, want to be inclusive, but they're like, nah, I just don't have the time for it. Sounds great. I just don't have the time for it. What would you like, I guess, if you heard that, what would come into your mind or what would? So I hear it all the time because it means that they're conceptualizing inclusive leadership or inclusion as extra, right? Rather than how. So I say to people, if you have a problem, you still have to fix it, right? And they're like, yeah. And you're still going to have to think about ways to fix it. And they're like, yeah. Like, well, why don't you think about how inclusive leadership or inclusion might help you solve it? So <laughs> to me, it's not about extra. It's actually... We all have to put time and effort into the challenges and the opportunities that come up in our workplace. So I talk to people about it, tell me your main challenge and let's talk about how inclusive leadership can help that challenge progress. And then they go, oh, you don't want to sit down and lecture me for a couple of hours about unconscious bias or a list of other things. You actually want to look at the things that are a problem for me and use this to help them. And I say, yes. So one thing I would say is I think there's a difference between teaching inclusion as an oppressive or anti-oppressive practice. So an oppressive practice is here's what's right and wrong. This is what you should or shouldn't do. And that's it. An anti-oppressive practice is here are some things to think about. What does that mean for you? How does that meet you and your lived experience? How would you shape it and define it? So I try to write the book with an anti-oppressive space so that people can think about how they want to be with the content rather than me telling them. So that's a piece. But the other piece is that often when inclusion is taught in workplaces, it's taught like extra work. So like you go to a training and they tell you what you should or shouldn't do. And 
but they don't necessarily connect it to your day-to-day -day work. They're not necessarily helping you with your problems and challenges at work. What they're doing is telling you about this extra stuff you're meant to do. And this is linked to UDL, which is Universal Design for Learning, which talks about how people learn. So I'm not going to unpack the whole thing, but an aspect of UDL is that you think about how is it relevant to people. What I talk about is how do we use this to help you with the things that cause you challenges or take up your time or the goals you have on your table already? How does inclusive leadership help you do your role and work better? Because you're going to have to put time into it anyway. So let's make it part of the solution rather than a separate piece of content that you must go and learn about that feels like it's not connected to your work. So one of the things I would say when I work with leaders, even before I use the term inclusive leadership, I would work with leaders and a lot of the problems they had were better solved by an inclusive approach. So what I mean is like people would say, you know, I'm having employee engagement challenges. And I was like, okay, how are you solving them? And they'd usually just be using something, a certain approach. And I'd say, well, if we actually got good feedback or we thought about what people's needs were, or we discussed things with people before making that decision, we might get a better quality result. That's a great idea, Sheila. Well, that's just an inclusive practice, right? So for me, inclusive leadership is about how you do your job. It is not an extra job. Mm. You can do it and not be inclusive or you can do it and be inclusive. And we know from the research that when you do it and you're inclusive, you're going to get richer results, better outcomes. Inclusion and inclusive leadership is part of your everyday problem solving, goal setting, achievement kind of orientation. It isn't in the way that I work with it about extra or about just like being able to use politically correct terms or tick a box it's actually how can you use inclusive leadership to solve the challenges you see every day and I joke because I talk about my nieces and nephews quite a bit like nobody's going to teach me about inclusion more than my nieces and nephews because you know I could have a problem or a challenge and I could tell them do something and then I realized that if I created buy-in by utilizing inclusion more helped them in the decision making what will we have for dinner how will we make that how will we solve this problem a, they would have been more engaged and B, they would have bought into the solution. Whereas, you know, when I tell them what they're having for dinner, I spend a lot of time fighting them at the dinner table. So for me, inclusion and inclusive leadership is about solving problems together and in the workplace is solving work problems together that have a positive impact on the people involved and a positive impact on the results you're trying to create. So it is not a separate thing. It is just how you solve problems, how you achieve goals, how you you know, structure what good looks like. It is not necessarily a load of extra trainings or or pieces of work. It's actually helping you do your job better. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. It's really interesting to hear again. Do you have any books, movies, films, programs where you see inclusive practice or something sparks like, oh, that's it or that's not it? When I was writing the book, I did get some input and I have a playlist. So it's from people who wanted to contribute what songs they wanted. So isn't the most diverse selection because it depends who, who contributed. But I'm open to people adding and suggesting songs. So one of the things I think is important is I try to get participants to think about inclusion beyond things that are trying to be inclusive. Right. So trying to see diversity and inclusion across our lives so there are some books and movies and things that that i highly recommend that happen to be inclusive like bridgerton has some really interesting examples of inclusion not because they're trying to be but because they're or non-inclusion it role models class really well because the actors weren't racialized for the piece it kind of sh shifts your thinking about how you maybe have racialized different periods of history there is a film that i saw over the weekend reindeer i think or my reindeer it is trigger warnings a very difficult piece to watch a like very difficult series it's on netflix but what it does is it uncovers some very different experiences that people have from abuse stalking grooming low self-esteem and a lot of people when they think about diversity and inclusion they don't think about the multifaceted nature of human beings they just think about identity and while identity is an important part of it i find that different films like that can kind of get you to think differently which is an inclusive practice then there's also things like the film about ruth ginsburg which was one of the she, i think she's the first female supreme judge in the usa and she her life story is quite interesting there's also hidden figures which is brilliant about uh, contributors in nasa who were i think they framed it as people of color is how they, they frame it in the film 
who were just written out of history and just shows you some of you know examples of their lived experience but also the examples of contributions they made to history that we know nothing about and I think these kind of things are really important that we're not just looking at inclusion movies as in the movies that are trying to demonstrate inclusion they're helpful but I think we need to go beyond it and we need to look for where examples of inclusion or exclusion are visible in our media experiences without necessarily them trying to highlight it it's just it's in the movie that we're watching. There are quite a few films that can be quite helpful to get you thinking about inclusion in different ways, but they haven't been written with inclusion in mind. Okay, and last thing, if someone's watching, where can they get your book if they're interested? Thank you. So if you go to my website, SheilaWalsh.com, S-I-L-E, Walsh.com, and you go to the book, you'll be able to get a link to buy the book, but also there is a kind of sneak peek into the 13 effective inclusive leadership practices and principles where you can see kind of a sneak peek of what I've written in the book but it's also slightly part of some of the stuff you brought up those practices and principles represent some of those underlying kind of pieces that I utilize so they can also download that by going to my website because it's on the top banner you can actually okay. sign up and download that straight away okay brilliant and I look forward to hearing more as well about your book thanks a million Thomas take care